All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Grady Metcalf, and uh, I am currently serving as your president for one more day. I didn't want to be too obvious about it, so I left the hours out. But I do want to just take a second and um, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I know it's a lot, you know, for you to, you know, take away from your your families, take away from your businesses to be here with us and, and support us. And uh, we're just grateful that um, that you all are here. Um, it is absolutely um, an honor and a privilege to um, welcome you to the first um, IAF annual convention. Um, I am, again, your president of the newly rebranded Integration Association of Florida. Today we gather here not only um, as individuals, um, but as a community driven by shared goals, aspirations, and a commitment to excellence in our industry. <clears throat> as we embark on this um, keynote presentation, um, I ask that we reflect um, the significance of coming together and exchanging ideas, um, insights, and innovation. In the spirit of collaboration and growth, uh, we are privileged to have Andy Sexton with Proactive Response Group and his team back by popular demand, who will undoubtedly enlighten us with their wisdom and expertise. And I have to add, I am super grateful that Andy made it back from Philadelphia, because I happened to run into him in the hotel in Philadelphia last week, so I'm glad you found your way back home and didn't get caught in the snow. But um, their insights will uh, definitely teach you uh, to recognize the early warning signs of violence, how to effectively respond to violence if it cannot be prevented, and how to provide medical aid to those that are injured to increase chances of survival. <clears throat> Throughout the next few days, I encourage each, uh, each one of you to actively engage, share your thoughts, and forge connections that will extend beyond the confines of this event. Thank you for being a part of this incredible gathering, <clears throat> and I wish uh, you all a productive, illuminating, and enjoyable experience. I would like to invite Frank, sorry, I hope I don't bust this up, um, Pietro Bono, did I nail it? Keeping up with last year, did you see that? With, uh, uh, with Responder up to the stage to share information with us. Frank, thank you for serving as our keynote sponsor, and we are grateful for your support. Thank you. You think you're a bit Italian there. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, listen, I got to tell you, we are so proud to be sponsors of this event, and based on the resume I read from these two folks that are coming up after me, you guys are in for a great keynote. But uh, let me just make sure I can work this thing here, the technology. Let's see how this works. There we go. Well, who is Responder and what do we do? I'm going to just take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about us. Um, there we go. As you guys know, um, our homes and businesses are getting smarter and smarter, and, and the stations that support them are also uh, getting smarter. The challenge we have, though, is that the police services that support them are not keeping up. And what does that mean? Well, we think that the bargain at the base of our, the heart of our industry is broken. I mean, what is the bargain? I think the bargain is that subscribers pay for services, buy systems with the, pre uh, with the um, uh, preference that they think they get access to police departments on a preferential basis. And we know that ain't so. In fact, we think it's getting worse as time goes on. It, the police services just can't keep it up. So the problem that, that uh, Responder tried to address is this puts your monitoring at risk. And this is what we wanted to address when we developed the Responder platform. We help you grow and, uh, and protect your recurring revenue. How we do that? We do it through a network model. We ba basically created an Uber-like application that basically networks guard services and puts them all on one software. What does that mean to you? So the network, w the way we operate is that we federate guard companies on one platform. We put them under a platform called uh, Responder, and I guess you, some people refer to us as the Uber-like app for guard services, but I think it's a lot more than that. What we did was we developed uh, two pieces of technology. One piece is a portal which is our SaaS-enabled technology. That's connected to your monitoring station, so when your operator needs to dispatch a guard, they just push a button, 
we have an Uber-like app that the guards ride around with, so all the guard companies assign an Uber-like app to their mobile guards so that we can track and we know exactly where every guard is. And when an alarm comes in, the monitoring station pushes a button, we know where they are. Similar to when you ride, like when you're ordering an Uber or a Lyft, you could see where the cars are. And the same thing that our platform does, we know where the guards are. So we can dispatch the closest available guard to your incident. This is all done, there we go. This is all done with, uh, with uh, using technology. The operator pushes a button, it comes to up to us. We dispatch to the guard, the guard fills out a report. Everything is done on the platform with complete transparency auditability and uh, it's all done using a network approach so that's my introduction obviously if you guys want some more information please go to our website uh, responder.io and or please track me down through the conference I'll be walking around the show floor tomorrow and uh, you can also reach me through LinkedIn I'm happy to set up a demo for you so that you can see exactly what it is that we do and how we do it but Enough about me and Responder, and uh, without further ado, um, it is my distinct honor to introduce Andy Sexton and Chad Ayers, the co-founders of Proactive Response Group, as our keynote speakers this afternoon. Andy and Chad, please join me on stage. <laughs> Well, let me uh, give you a little bit of a bio on, on the two gentlemen that are about to speak to you this afternoon here. Andy Sexton spent 12 years uh, with Greenville County Sheriff's Office in South Carolina, where he held the rank of Uniform Patrol Sergeant. During his time in Greenville County Sheriff's Office, Andy gained vast experience in criminal investigation, including armed robbery and homicide. Andy was a member of the SWAT team. Don't mess with these two guys, by the way. Uh, for six years and served as the assistant SWAT leader, he was involved in numerous uh, high-risk incidences, including hostage rescue as well as protection of high-level dignitaries. Andy served on the training committee for Greenville County Sheriff's Office. He was chosen to assist in the creation and implementation of the Greenville County Sheriff's Active Shooter Response Curriculum. In 2012, Andy was awarded the Medal of Valor. The award recognizes deputy who willingly risks his or her life in the furtherance of law enforcement mission or to save another. Andy is a 2006 honor graduate at, of CIS Citadel, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in criminal justice and a 2006 graduate for the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy, where he was honored, he was an honor graduate. You can clap right now if you want. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Chad, um, Chad Ayers served as the Sheriff's Deputy for Greenville County in South Carolina for 12 years. During his time as the Deputy in Greenville County, Chad worked undercover in numerous federal and state investigations performing in high pressure environments. Chad was a member of the SWAT team where he served as the assistant leader as well. He experienced, he's experienced in hostage negotiations, rescue as well as active shooter events. Chad, who assisted in the creation and implementation of the Greenville County's Office Active Shooter Response Program, and during his tenure as a deputy, Chad received numerous awards and accommodations. In 2006, was named Greenville County Sheriff Rookie of the Year. In 2008, Distinguished Service Award. In 2009, he was awarded two letters of accommodation for undercover work. He was a recipient of the Greenville County Sheriff's Medal of Valor in 2011 and 2012. And in 2016, Chad received the 2015 Sam Simmons Award, which is given to the top deputy in Greenville County. Chad is a two, also a 2006 graduate at the University of South Carolina with a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice and a 2006 South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy graduate, where he received the Academy's top award, the J.P. Strom Award, given to graduates with the highest academic average. Chad is also a movie star. He starred in season one of A&E TV's Emmy, win Emmy Award winning documentary, Live PD. Andy and Chad, very impressive backgrounds and we look forward to learning more from you today. Thank you for your service. I will turn this over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I guess I paid my mother a lot of money to write that bio. Um, like I said, I'm Chad Ayers, I'm one of the founders let me start off, though, by saying it speaks highly of you guys um, to take time to be here, to travel here, and, and thank you for the association for having us. 
<coughs> a little bit of more background on us to lay the foundation of how we got started. I said Andy and I came from the Greenville County Sheriff's Office. Team leaders for the SWAT team. Um, back in 09, we wrote the curriculum for the agency. So how our first responders in the upstate of South Carolina respond to mass casualty events. We rolled the program out and we saw great results. There's no doubt in my mind that the majority of law enforcement agencies around this country are ready to respond to these types of events. Fast forward two years later, Andy and I were at a bonfire. We were sitting there and I looked down at my watch. It was 11.30 p.m. All right, the bottle of Woodford was empty and I said, it's time to have a good conversation. I said, the problem is this, our program's great. Our men and women are ready to respond. But the problem is we are not the first line of defense. So an active shooter event happens, the Calvary's coming. EMS, fire, law enforcement, everyone's coming. But you guys, the civilians, you're the first line of defense. You're the first ones who have the ability to positively affect the outcome if and when one of these was to take place. So we started the company in late 2014, and then in 2015, left law enforcement to run the um, and this is all we do. So now we, our teams now travel the United States teaching workplace violence prevention and active shooter response to corporations, churches, and schools all over the country. Um, we have trained uh, in person over 130,000 uh, on what you're going to go through today. But you have to understand this, and if you do, even after today, I cannot prevent an active shooter event from happening anywhere. If someone determines they're going to walk in this room right now and commit a mass act of violence, they're going to do it. But our training today is designed to minimize casualties and increase the chance of survival. And you're going to hear myself and Andy and the rest of the team that you're going to meet here in a little bit, you're going to hear us say that word over and over today. Survive, survive, survive. Nothing else matters other than you going home to see your families at the end of the day. So we're going to do a little bit of PowerPoint here at the beginning just to lay a foundation. Then we're going to get up. We're going to move around and do some hands-on stuff. This is what I ask. All right? If we ask you to break up into sections or move around, all right, try to stay on time. If you need to, look, all grown adults, there are no bathroom breaks. You need to use the restroom, go to the restroom, come back, all right? But ask questions. If you sit here and stare at us for the next couple hours, you know what it'll be like, all right? So ask questions, be interactive. Andy, it's all yours. All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to start off with our learning objectives today. And before I get there, though, how many of you saw me speak last year? Raise your hand. All right, so a little bit less than half. So to some of y'all, some of this information is going to be a refresher for you. Some of you, it's going to be brand new. What we hope to do today is improve your threat recognition. And what I mean by that is when we study the attacks that have happened in our country, in workplaces, schools, and churches, this we see question. that there were often early warning signs there, indicators, changes of behavior that were yeah. seen by coworkers, family members, friends, but they did nothing about it or they didn't let the right people know. So we've got to get better at learning what those early warning signs are so that we can get better our response. Many of you actually have technology that will help with that. The recognition of a firearm in a location, the sound of gunfire, early detection of people that are not supposed to be in certain places, right? That's a layer of protection. We have to have those layers. They gotta be good, but we also have to have people that are trained to do the right thing when they have that information, all right? What we then hope to do is improve your response to the threat. We need to make sure that if you ever find yourself in an active shooter situation, that you know what options you have that lead to you being a survivor. We do not believe in passive actions. I don't believe that if you hide under that table right now and a bad guy comes through this room that you're gonna survive. You can't defend yourself under there. You're a sitting duck. We believe that if you know the right options that you can drastically increase your chances of survival. And one of those options is not sitting around doing nothing, all right? So our ultimate goal though is to build your survival, survivor's mindset to make sure that you know no matter what, if you're shot, run over by a car, I don't care what, that you're gonna live. The human body is very amazing and also medical science has advanced over the past decade greatly. Most gunshot wounds are survivable now. Actually, 86% of single gunshot wounds are survivable. Some people think that's wrong, look it up. Most people that get shot don't die, all right? Now, one of the, th the ways that we're gonna make sure that that happens for you is by the tourniquets you see on the table in front of you and the wound packing stations that you see set up out here, all right? Now, when we get to that, we're gonna ask you to move around. There is fake blood there. If you don't want blood, we'll talk about that as we go. They'll make sure you have gloves and everything else that you need to do that safely. And, and the reason we do this is because when we study the active attacks, we see that some of them, 60% of the people that died in the attack could be alive if they knew how to use the tourniquet sitting in front of you or pack a wound, all right? That's a big number. Outside of that, you have car accidents, industrial accidents, all kinds of things that might happen that you would see where you could use this bleeding control equipment. And 
Real quick before I actually jump into our training, I need my guys in the back to raise their hands for me. I've got um, Chris Taylor back there. Chris Taylor's retired law enforcement with close to 30 years of experience. You have uh, right beside him, you have Chris Fletcher. He's actually currently serving in the same role that I left. He's the assistant team leader for the SWAT team in Greenville, South Carolina. You have Jimmy Pregel. Jimmy was a Marine, a contractor, a firefighter, just about everything. So there's Jimmy um, back in the back. And then you also have John Cross. John Cross has lots of experience, uh, former law enforcement, and then a lot of experience in the security industry as well. Uh, so those are the guys that are going to be teaching you today along with us up here on the stage. Now, we have to understand that these events are unpredictable acts of violence. There's absolutely no way that our team could come in here and give you every step and say, listen, y'all start number one, go down here to number 10, and you're going to survive. Absolutely. We can give you options, yes, though, options that we know we might have you call in. will limit the casualties in anything. and increase your chances of surviving. Yeah. It will be up to you to decide which option works best for you. Your circumstances dictate your actions. We do not believe in this one-size-fits-all, lockdown, shelter-in-place, hold, secure, all this terminology gets thrown out because that's not always the best choice for every person in every situation. That administrator who's making that call from their office or their house or wherever it is and saying everybody locked down, he doesn't have the information that you do when you're there. We believe that if we share information with you the best that we can, that gives you the best chance to make a good choice for yourself. All right? So <clears throat> we got to start and get everybody on the same yeah, page. Yeah, I think this group will have a, a pretty easy time understanding this. Well, but what an active shooter actually is, and we use the FBI's the definition stage. here to keep everything consistent. The FBI says an active shooter is an individual actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill in a confined and populated area. Y'all take two seconds while I stand up here. Read that definition. If you're confused, raise your hand. It's simple, right? The definition's too easy. So when we look at it, though, there's a couple of words that jump out at me when I read it. First, that word right there. Y'all talk to me here. What do I have to have to be a shooter? A gun. Now, does that mean that these attacks only happen with guns? What else could I use to commit an attack that would fit that definition? Machete, knives, edged weapons. What else? Bombs, so explosives. Cars, other vehicles. Now, listen, all these things we've actually seen here in the United States of America recently, but they don't get a lot of news coverage like the gun crimes do. I don't care what somebody's trying to kill me with, I don't want to die. So our goal is to train you to respond no matter what weapon somebody is using, and you may actually hear us today refer to these situations as active assailants, active attacker, active murderer, because we don't care about what weapon they're using, we care about their actions, all right? And the next thing I see up here is these two words here, actively engaged. Sounds bad, right? They're actively engaged in killing you. That is bad. But when I think a little bit deeper about it, what it truly means to me is they haven't killed me yet. It means that I still have the ability to positively affect the outcome for myself and for other people. How many of you in this room serve in a leadership role? You lead other people within your organization. Good many of you, right? Now, does that mean that because you're a leader, because you raised your hand just a second ago, that you have to sacrifice yourself for those other people in a violent encounter? No, it does not mean that. Are there people in this room that might choose to do that? Sure. But it doesn't mean that. What it means is you have to be selfish. And if you selfishly make good choices for yourself that lead to you being a survivor, will you save other people? Tons of examples of this. One person making a good choice and others follow them right away, and it saves countless people. One recent example that I heard of, um, talking with a lady whose son left the shooting at Sandy Hook, he heard the bad guy having to reload his gun, and so he ran out the door. Nine other kids followed him out the door. He didn't say a word to him. He just ran, and the kids followed him. All right? Make good choices to lead to other people surviving as well. Now, this is not a secret that's up on the board right now. These events are happening more frequently now than they used to. I wish I knew exactly what was causing it. I don't. But I do see a trend, and that trend is stress. Somebody give me a number, 1 through 10, that tells me where stress levels are in our country right now. One being the lowest, 10 being the highest. Where do you think they are? Nine, eight, nine and a half. Nobody in here is saying one or two, right? So stress levels are high. Talk to me again. What's causing that? And I don't need your personal stress. I need, in general, what's causing high stress levels? Your wife? <laughs> All right, so 
let's, let, our, our families, right? So we have stress individual, as individuals in our families. What else? Work, finances, inflation, gas prices. What else? Politics. So we're right in the middle of primary season, right at the beginning of it. Um, who's excited about seeing all these ads on TV and getting calls every day for donations? Who loves that kind of stuff? Nobody. It's stressful for all of us. And I don't care who you vote for, right? But it's stressful. Now, are there things in your life, stressors, that you do not control? Say that again. So, so what you're getting at is watching, watching the news might stress you out a little bit more than it should. So, right, so let me, let, me, let me kind of make this next point based on what you're saying there. So when we talk about stressors in our lives, are there things that you don't control? Do any of you control what the news media puts on the, on the TV? Nobody in here does, right? Do we control if we watch it or not, though? Yes. So that's one way that I limit my stress. I do not watch the news before I teach one of these classes because if I did, no matter what they're showing on there, it would piss me off and I'd be up here angry, all right? So I choose to limit that stressor in my life. Are there other examples just like that that you could limit the stress in your life in certain areas? Do you think you do a good job of that, anybody? Say that again. Big, the big picture? So we're, well, we're gonna jump off the media though. I'm talking about stress in general. Stress in general, do you guys do a good job of limiting the stressors in your life? Raise your hand if you think you do. Raise your hand if you think you could do better. Keep your hand up if you think that limiting your stress in your life could make you more effective at your job, more likable, and easier to work with. All right? And I'm also going to tell you this. Based on our research and what I see with violence, I firmly believe that if we could lower our stress levels, we could lower the rates of workplace violence that we're seeing right now. So a challenge for today is to actively find things in your life that stress you out and limit them. It'll make you a better person, all right? Now I'm gonna jump to the types of people that commit these attacks. First, we have violent actors with no connection to your business or staff or the places that you're going to, because I know most of you go in a lot of different places in any given week or day, right? So this typically happens by somebody that's unrelated to the facilities you're at. They're robbing the store down the road, they get caught by the cops, they run because they don't want to go back to jail. And they look and they see a building and they say, you know what, I could go in there. I can make my last stand, I can kill a few people before the cops catch me. All right, could that happen at the places y'all go to? Are there layers of protection generally that prevent it? Tell me some of them. Doors, so we've got controlled access, whether that's key cards, uh, actual manual lock, whatever you got, right? Controlled access, what else? Lighting, so you can see, especially at night. What else? Cameras. Cameras. All right, so we could go on and on about layers of protection, right? Some places have more than others. Do you think each one of those layers, though, is beatable? No matter how good they are, you can beat them. And I'll tell you this. So one of the, the other parts of our job is what we call penetration tests. Y'all are probably familiar with that. We try and break into people's buildings. We try and beat those layers of protection. Every time I can beat a layer of protection by exploiting people. Not the actual system that's in place, but the people that are using it. People always let me in. I dress like them, I talk like them, and I walk right in their building every time. All right? Layers of protection are great, but they're only as good as the people that are enforcing them, the people that are using them. All right? Next category we're going to look at, we've got actors that target your business or staff. And again, I don't know each one of you sitting out here where you work or where you go on a regular basis, but there's a lot of reasons why somebody might target a specific business. It could be because they have a lot of workers there. They've got 1,000 employees, and it'd be a, a big target for them. It could be because they're a nationally recognized name, a uh, Fortune 500 company, and it would make a big impact on the news. All right? Each one of you should have conversations as business leaders about what risk you have in the places that you are on a regular basis, and how are we mitigating those? What layers of protection do we have in place, and are they appropriate for the risk? Next two categories we're going to talk about are where we see the most frequent occurrence of workplace violence, and we see the biggest ability for us to positively affect the outcome. 
We're gonna look at bias targeting coworkers, supervisors, and managers by current or former employees. Fired employees, people that get fired, are they happy when they get fired? Are we happy when they get fired? As a coworker, do I enjoy seeing my coworker get terminated and lose their job? Not typically, all right? Um, do the people that are doing the terminations, like your HR reps, do they love firing people? They shouldn't, right? Um, so we all agree that getting fired sucks. Let me ask y'all this, so if I get fired today, what do y'all think I'm gonna do at the airport tonight on my way home? Somebody said it over here, I'm gonna be drinking, all right? I'm gonna find some way to cope with my loss. Drinking and alcohol and drugs, that kind of stuff, that's what people typically cope with. I'm probably gonna be angry. I'm gonna get home late tonight on the airplane, have to catch an Uber home because I drank too much. I'm gonna wake up in the morning with a headache, drink some Gatorade, eat a couple Advil. And what do you think I'm gonna be doing tomorrow? It's Tuesday, I got a long week ahead of me. A long week ahead of me to do what? Right, look for another job. I'm gonna be on indeed.com, linkedin.com, finding another job. Does that sound like a reasonable way to solve the problem of unemployment to y'all? I cope with it, I get angry, but I find another job and I move on. We've all probably been there before, right? We all might be there again in the future. Are there people though in this world that say, you know what, that's not for me, Andy, that's not a good solution for me. The solution for me is I'm gonna go home, get my gun, and I'm gonna go back to Florida and kill the people that fire, got me fired. Are there people in this world that think that way? Unfortunately, there are. The good news for us is a small percentage of people, all right? Now let's jump over here to current employees. Is there anybody in here who works for an employer that employs more than 500 people? So pretty big employees. So let's take, let's just say 500 is the base number here. Do y'all think that at least one of those 500 people is disgruntled or upset with their current working conditions? And we could even play that down to a 10 person workforce. At least one of those people is probably upset about something, right? Again, you have a lot of options there. Most of us, if we have a problem with a coworker, we're gonna do a few things, right? We might go talk to him about it to solve the problem. We might take it to HR, to a supervisor, to a third party that can help us. Or we might just do nothing about it and deal with it and, and complain to other people. But most of us don't think about bringing a gun to work and solving the problem. Are there people in this world that do think that is a solution? All right, so we gotta wrap our brain around that. Now what I'm gonna get to after this last point here is what are the early warning signs that we might look for within our own organizations or the organizations we're serving that would allow us to see these early warning signs that that employee, that disgruntled coworker, is going down a pathway towards violence. Isolation's a big one, we're gonna get there. Withdrawal from your social circles, it's huge, all right? So last category though before I jump to that, violent actors with a personal relationship with someone in the workplace. Is domestic violence real? Is it enjoyable to talk about? Is it fun for somebody who lives in an abusive relationship to go to work and be hey, listen, y'all, um, I know we're great friends. Y'all know my wife, she's real sweet, but actually she's gonna kill me one day. She's violent, she beats me, and she's threatened to kill me. She's gonna do it one day. Would that be a pleasant conversation? No, no nobody wants to have that, regardless, man, woman, married, living together. Could it be an important conversation to have, though? Tell me why. All right, so they, they know what I'm going through, so they could help me. They might be able to intervene and prevent it, right? So is it just my life though, the one who's living in that abusive relationship that's at risk? Who else's life is at risk, sir? Everybody involved. So what you're telling me is there could be a time where you notify the entire workforce, all 500 people that work for this gentleman over here, that I have a crazy wife and she might come up here and kill people. Could that happen? I'm probably not gonna say it that way, right? We're gonna have to be a little bit kinder in our words but there could be a time where you have to let the entire workforce know that somebody within your workforce is living in an abusive relationship and it might turn violent because awareness is important. Now, I'm gonna look at these early warning signs. I'm gonna put all of them up and I'm gonna go through these quickly. Now, in our typical class, I do have a little bit more time to go through these, but today I'm gonna go through it quick because I feel like the section that Chad is gonna go through is more applicable to you in this group, okay? So what we wanna look for is the development of personal grievances. Are there grievances in workforces? Yes, and I don't care where you work, there's gonna be grievances there. What we have to do is we've gotta to learn to distinguish between a professional grievance and a personal grievance. Professional grievances are, sir, what's your name? Or Greg, let's say Greg and I work together and we get into an argument about a specific project because we both wanna get it done right for the boss. 
that's a professional grievance. We don't typically see that leading to violence in the workplace. We usually see that leading to us solving the problem. Yeah, we might get loud, we might get upset with each other, but we solve the problem, all right? Where it becomes a problem in, in violence is if it's personal in nature. And when I show up to work, I get a personal grievance with you, and then you, and then you, and then you, and then you. Leaders in this room, would that be a problem in your workforce if one person came to work and started grievances with a large percentage of your workforce? Something we need to get ahead of? All right, now let's look at social media, and I'm going to hit this quick. Social media can be a great tool for us. People are willing to post anything on social media because there's nobody staring back at them to talk to them or argue with them. All right, so they'll post anything. A couple of things I want you to pay close attention to is an inappropriate interest in weapons. The wording there is important. This word is important. Our background that Frank read, that Chad gave you more on, I was a cop, I was on the SWAT team. Give you a couple more things I like to hunt, I like to fish, I like to do anything outside that involves weapons. Do you think I have an interest in guns? Yes. Do you think on my social media I posted a picture of me with a gun or a bow and arrow in my hand before? Yes, all the time. Actually, I don't post very much. Chad looked it up the other day. The last time I posted was in 2022, and it was a picture of me shooting my bow and arrow. All right? I'm up to 78 Instagram followers. Do you think when they see me with a – I was doing good. Thank you. See, 75 was my magic number. I'm above it, right? Um, so, but when those 78 people saw that picture of me shooting my bow and arrow at a target in my yard, did they get concerned? No, because it's my normal behavior. They know me. They follow me because we went to high school or college together or we participate in the same activities. We have to draw a line there about what's inappropriate. There's a lot of appropriate reasons people post about weapons online. I want to start putting the pieces of the puzzle together, and if I see a coworker who's posted about guns and they've never posted about guns before, I want to start to dig deeper. I want to look and see, have they posted inappropriately about past mass acts of violence? Do they have an interest in Sandy Hook, in Las Vegas, in Orlando, in Uvalde, in all these shootings? If I start to see a pattern of them being interested in all these shootings that they could not possibly have had a personal connection to, would my interest and my concern for that person rise? So you understand the difference there between an appropriate and inappropriate interest in weapons and past mass acts of violence. If I lost a loved one in one of these attacks, I'm probably going to post about it one year from now, five years from now, ten years from now to remember my loved one, right? If I lived through the shooting because I worked at the place that it happened, I'm probably going to post about it on social media to build awareness and prevent it from happening somewhere else. We have to look at the context. Next thing we want to look at is an uncharacteristic drop in work performance. We've all had bad days, bad weeks, bad months. We'll all probably have those again. Where we draw the line, though, is that employee who has a bad week, the supervisor addresses it, and they say, boss, thanks for bringing this to my attention, but I actually don't care about my performance. You're laughing because you might have had those people before, right? I would be concerned for them because they've got no motivation or aspiration to be a valuable member of our team. As human beings, somebody already touched on this. As human beings, we want to belong to other things. Isolation is not good for us. And this is coming from a big introvert standing up on stage in front of you. Uh, I would much rather be out in the woods by myself. I could live in a cardboard box in the mountains, all right? But I have to be around other people because that's the way I was designed. So we have to understand that. The isolation comes next. Withdrawal from their normal social circles. Would that be concerning if you had a coworker who withdrew and never plugged back into another group of people? Who became a loner? Watch the news after the next one of these attacks. Go back and do some research. Look at the interviews after these attacks. You will always see a family member, a loved one, a neighbor come out and say, man, I knew that guy. Right up before the attack, he became withdrawn. He became a loner. It wasn't like him. All right, we got to pay attention to these early warning signs. And the last one up there is a recent significant personal loss. These could be as simple as a death in the family, right? We all understand that a death in the family is stressful for anybody experiencing it. We're good about surrounding and supporting people. We're not good about maintaining that support. We remember it today and tomorrow because that coworker's gone. They're at the funeral or doing whatever else, right? A week from now when they're back at work, we don't remember it anymore because it wasn't our loved one that was lost. But does that person still need some help? Do they still need your support? A month from the day of the loss, do they still need your support? Six months, a year, three years? How good are we at maintaining support for people that have lost someone? I'm not good at it. No matter how many times I stand in front of a group and tell people about it, I'm still not good at it. I try. I set reminders in my phone. If you're my coworker and I know you've lost somebody, 
I'm going to set a reminder in my phone for a week from now to come back and check on you for a month and for a year. Do you think that could have a big impact on stress levels in our workplaces if we simply showed a little bit more care for other people and we remembered things longer than just a day or two? Next thing I'm going to look at is how do we actually report these things? A couple of things we want to look at on reporting them. Number one, I could go talk face to face with that person and say, man, I've noticed these changes in your behavior. Are you okay? Do you need something? Do y'all think there's obstacles that prevent that from happening? Say that. Fear of what? Yeah, you don't want to make them upset by confronting them and talking to them about it. And if I went to everybody in this room, you could each give me an obstacle that would prevent you from going face to face and having a tough conversation. It's not easy to do. Could it be important though? Could we change the direction of somebody's life by going to them and saying, I've noticed these changes, are you okay? Talk to me, y'all awake? I, I think we could, but every one of us is not willing to do that. So the next level we would go to is going to their supervisor, going to HR and saying, hey, I've noticed Chad, he's changing, he's doing this, this, and this, and I'm concerned for his health. All right, are we always willing to do that? Who would want to be the snitch in their office? We got one person, two people raised their hands. All right. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. I encourage you, if you see some problems, go talk to the appropriate person. Don't gossip about it. Make sure that you're going factually to that HR representative or supervisor. Uh, but there's obstacles that prevent that from happening. How many of you have an anonymous reporting system where you go for harassment or concerns or ethics hotlines in your workplace? Raise your hand if you've got an anonymous reporting system. Very few. And I don't know if you're the person responsible for this, but I highly encourage you to check on this, to make sure that within your organization, you have a third party anonymous reporting hotline for harassment and violence in the workplace. We will not get everybody to report things. It's impossible. But if we have an anonymous system, we encourage people to report that otherwise wouldn't. And then you'll see up there, it also says an employee assistance program. Who has an employee assistance program here? Raise your hand. A few hands went up. My guess is that probably many of you that didn't raise your hand actually have an employee assistance program, but you don't know about it or you forgot about it. They could be very valuable to you. They could be very valuable to your coworkers. Make sure you know about those um, organizations as well. So what I've been doing over the past few minutes is building your levels of situational awareness, making sure you know what's going on as it relates to violence in the workplace. How many of you think you do a good job of paying attention to your surroundings and not getting distracted? A few of you. Some of y'all in this industry probably do better than most people we talk to, but we all get distracted, right? And this diagram on the board is a tool that we still use as a team every day to make sure that we are reasonably aware of our surroundings. You'll see there's four different levels up here. You have condition white, relaxed, and unaware. Who thinks that's a good place to be when you're at work? One, one person, but you're laughing at me now. Do you think that bad things could happen to you if you are relaxed and unaware of your surroundings? All right, so that's not a good place to be at work or most of the time outside of your home. We need to find times to relax and become unaware of our surroundings, but we should choose them carefully. Where we should all live is in condition yellow, relaxed and aware of your surroundings. I'm not here today to make you paranoid, but if you can increase your level of awareness, you might see things ahead of time so that you can respond more effectively to them. What happens to us if we live in condition yellow, subconsciously, if we notice something that's not normal for the environment, we move down to condition orange, where we've become aware of a potential threat. Two cautions I give you here. Number one, avoid tunnel vision. Tunnel vision is that hyper-focus that you get when you see something that increases your stress level, and that's the only thing you can see. Could there be other things in your environment that could also hurt you? Call it pushing your vision out. Take a deep breath and look around you. You also have to understand that sometimes when you're in condition orange, there will be things that catch your attention, but they're not actually threats to you. We've gotta be able to go from condition orange back to condition yellow. And then condition red up there, Confirm the threat and you're ready to act. That's where Chad's gonna come up here in a second. He's gonna walk through your actual options when the threat is there. What can you do to make sure you increase your chances of survival? Last slide before I bring him up here. Prioritize people's safety. In general, do you think that society today tells us we must be politically correct? Do you think we go overboard on that sometimes? And, and we probably don't say things that we should say because we're worried about offending somebody else or hurting their feelings or what people will think of us. 
Yes. All right. I'm here today to tell you that as Chad and I travel the country, giving these discussions, talking with people, we offend people all the time, hurt their feelings. Do you think I care? Not a bit. And it's not because I enjoy hurting people's feelings. It's because I know if I don't say it or I don't say it the right way, they could die. So I say it anyway, and if I hurt your feelings, I'll apologize to you after the presentation. All right? Could you need to apply that same standard in your line of work? People's safety is more important than their feelings. All right, we've got to correct that. Next thing we're going to look at is notification of other people. That's going to be important. The sooner people know that they're living in an emergency, the sooner they can respond to it. Delay in there means more dead people. All right? So how can you notify people quickly of an emergency? Give me some thoughts. Throw them out. You could yell. You could use your voice. That's a quick one. What else? A text. And I'm not going to do this today because I don't have the time. But if I were to try and do it, and I was trying to get you to pull up an existing text group that you have right now of your coworkers and send out a text that says there's a gunman in the building, it would take you a lot longer than you think. It is an option. It's just not a quick one. What else? Pull an alarm. We're careful with that. Chad's going to elaborate on that in a second because if it's not the right alarm, it might send the wrong signal. All right? So... There's a lot of ways. You could yell to somebody. You could use a PA, use some type of electronic means. If you've got an actual uh, alert or an alarm that indicates an active shooter, you could do that. We wouldn't want to pull a fire alarm for a gunman because now people might go rally up at the fire rally point. That's bad. All right? So we've got to make sure that within our own organizations, we know how we would notify other people around us. And I encourage you to notify them in plain language, no secret codes. All right? So, for instance, if there's a white guy in a black shirt and blue pants and he's got a gun, that's exactly what I want you to say. Does that give each one of you in this room an idea of what the emergency is and who's causing it? Is there any room for misinterpretation of what I just said? It's pretty clear that you need to do something right now, right? Chad, they're all yours. Summer, yes or no? Yes. <clears throat> you find yourself in an active shooter situation. What is the main goal? Main goal? Survive, Survive all right? Is it going to mess? Can I get down here? Are y'all good with that? I don't have this. Um, survival is the main goal. With that being said, we know evacuation gives us the best chance to live. Removing myself from any violent encounter in life gives me the best chance to survive. If I'm not where the bad guy is or where the stuff's going on, I can't get hurt. With that, though, we have to familiarize ourselves with all emergency exits. As humans, are we not creatures of habit? Do we do the same thing every day? By show of hands, how many of you drive to work the same route every day? Go home the same route, enter an exit the same door. If you're anything like me, 4.15 a.m., this goes off. As Chad, get your butt off. Andy, your mic's on. Your mic's on. Okay. I, it, let me tell you, you put a bunch of SWAT guys in the back with an open mic, and it's a disaster waiting to happen. All right? Like, it's an HR nightmare. Um, but this starts going off. I need to get my butt up go to the gym. Right? I push that button right there. That's seven more minutes to sleep. But I wake up, I start the shower, I brush my teeth, make a cup of coffee. I, I do the same thing every day. But my question to you is this. On that day, when you're at your office or, or a location where you're working and the gunfire erupts, you are so used to going in and out of that one door under stress. And let me assure you, it'll be the most stressful day of your life. Will you know your other ways out? Understanding this, it may not be a door, correct? Could it be the drop tile ceiling in your office? Could it be a window? Can it be through the sheetrock? You see, we're here today to give you options. I cannot come in here and say, hey, uh, Greg, hey, in an active shooter event, if there's an active shooter, pull this piece of paper off your cork board and follow those steps. In fact, if you do that, close a shredder and shred that. I have to give you options that lead to your survival. I mean, there's been Gazette newspaper shooting up in Annapolis, Maryland. Gazette wrote a story about a guy. He gets pissed off. He shows up. He barricades the back doors, comes around to the front, walks in, boom, 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 starts shooting people out in the Gazette. They ran out of their offices to get away, get to the back door, saw that they were barricaded, turned right back, ran to the gunman, lost their life. What was on either side of the barricaded doors at the back? Big glass windows. But under stress, they didn't think that. They didn't think about that, and they lost their life. Let me ask you this. Raise your hand. Anyone would raise their hand and say, hey, we appreciate you coming down from South Carolina, but just so you know, we will never have an active shooter event here at our office. Could it happen this afternoon? Go back. Walk around and figure out what your avenues of escape are. Maybe you find yourself in a situation where you can't get out. That's where we got to make it hard for the bad guy to get to us. All right? In most of your offices or conference rooms, 
What's the quickest way to slow someone down from getting in? Shut and let's just say this is my door. Shut and lock the door. Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about that in the breakout session. But a locked door is your greatest layer of protection. Would you not agree? This isn't Hollywood where the gunman's over here shooting the door locks. Go ahead, waste your ammo on that. I'm buying time for me and whoever's in this office. These events only end a few ways. They give up very rarely. When have you take them down? I like it. Law enforcement takes them out or about 40, 44% do what? They take their own life, right? Police science did a study that says the majority of them do it when they hear the sirens coming because they know it's over with at that point. Time is not on the gunman's hands. What is your most precious commodity that day? It's time. We shut, we lock, we barricade it. I'll talk more about that on the breakout session. Andy just finished talking about the four types of gunmen. The four types of gunmen, which two may spend extra time trying to get into that locked room or that locked office? So the last two. Okay, uh, what's your name? Dean. Dean. All right, Dean. Um, I've been terminated. All right. Six weeks later, little Johnny's looking up at me. Daddy, I'm hungry. Can't put bagel bites on the table anymore. Truck's been repoed. I'm about to lose the house. And I snap. I say, Dean, you snitched on me. Richard, you fired me. Y'all did the target C attack. Nobody else gets hurt unless you try to intervene and then you're collateral damage. Or, Barb, you and I are going through a nasty divorce. Nasty Right? And you say, hey, I'm, I want the kids 100%. I said, no, no, we're 50-50 custody. You said, nope, Chad's got a drinking problem, a cocaine habit. He will never see the kids again. And I snap. And I know where your office is. It's office 104. You've always worked there. I might spend extra time trying to get to that location. Right? We shut, we lock, we barricade. As we do that, though, I want to make sure I have an improvised weapon, something that I can use to defend myself. I know it's all different across the country, but would you not agree, across the United States, for the most part, most workforces are gun-free zones, right? I didn't see a bunch of Glocks on hips when I walked in today, all right? You don't have to have a gun to win one of these attacks. So many of these attacks have been stopped by unarmed people. Are there improvised weapons in this room right now? Talk to me. Chairs, Yeti cups, Stanley mugs, pens. Secure, all sorts of stuff, right? I'll tell you my favorite one. My favorite one is, it, they're, I mean, you're, you're kind of in the business in a sense, right? They're red. And, what'd you say? You ever seen, Dean, you're my man today. Dean, you ever seen what comes out of a fire extinguisher? That thick, yellow, powdered crap? If I'm a bad guy and I'm moving down the hallway, Dean, all you can do is blast me in the face with that fire extinguisher. As a gunman, is that going to cause some issues with me? Oh, in sleep mode, like you got to think outside the box here. I don't care what kind of gun you have. Nobody's like, ah, and fighting through it. It's disorienting. They can't see. We're buying. So again, just like finding your avenues of escape, go through your office and figure out what you would use as an improvised weapon. I'll talk more about that later. But is there not power numbers? I'm going to stay here for a second and everyone look at me. All eyes on me. A little Tupac quote. All right. What I'm about to say is going to ruffle some feathers and probably be totally different than you've heard before. Piss some people off. I don't care. I really don't. Is there not power in numbers? The majority of these attacks are committed by solo gunmen, correct? One person with a gun. As a solo gunman, I can only shoot one person at a time, yes or no? Shake your head, yes. Again, that's the issue that I have with the whole run, hide, fight training model, guys. Y'all heard that, run, hide, fight? This is an inactive shooter event. You can't get out, silence your cell phone, get under your desk, and be real quiet. Okay, you mean to tell me I'm the pissed off employee. What's your name? I make it into Brian's office. He's sitting under his desk. You think I'll be like, oh, you watch the video. I won't shoot you. I mean, come on. Is his desk going to stop a bullet? No. Can he defend himself under his desk? No. So when I make it into his office, what happens to Brian? He dies. We call them active shooter events to be politically correct. You better wrap your mind around it. They're active murderers. They're here to take as many lives in the short amount of time as possible. Victims hide under their desk. You are not a victim. You're a survivor. That's what drives me nuts about these school districts across this country, right? What do they do with your kids in an active shooter drill? They shove 26 kids to the corner of a room. Miss Jane stands there with her little denim jumper with the apple on the front. Shh, y'all be quiet. As a bad guy, I make it in that classroom. Where's all my targets at? One spot. I don't even have to be a marksman. I just start pulling the trigger. Why are we not giving our kids a chance to survive? 
If the gunman is inside the school, if the gunman is inside your office, if the gunman's inside your church, where's he not at? Outside. So why are we not popping doors, windows, chucking kids out? Go, run, take off. I had a superintendent in Pennsylvania one time say, we can't do that. We may lose a child. When was the last time little Timmy ran off in the woods and was never found? I'll tell you this. I'd much rather be outside looking for your lost kid in the woods and working a crime scene with him in that classroom. It's time you as adults and leaders in this community step up to the plate and start asking some tough discussions and have some tough discussions with these school districts. People often ask Andy and I, what's the worst thing you ever saw in your career? And it's easy. We weren't part of it. But Andy and I went through the after action report and crime scene photos from Sandy Hook Elementary School. They shoved 20 first graders in the corner of a room. It's the first room you went into, and I wish that never looked back. Would you not all agree it's much more difficult to shoot you guys the way you're seated right now than it would be if you were all huddled together? Let's go back to Uvalde. Fourth grade teacher gets shot numerous times. And again, they, they just released this report last week. He was shot numerous times. He survived, but he lost every student in his room that day. And he's sobbing on Good Morning America or one of those shows. He says, it's, it's, it sucks. He said, I can't live with myself. He said, the school told my kids and told me to tell my kids in an active shooter, to tell my fourth graders, get under your desk, lay down under your desk, and pretend you're taking a nap if he comes in. We have to do better. Think about this. There's power in, if seriously, think about this. If all of a sudden I was seated right here and I stood up and I swung around and someone's like, gun! And I had 95 iPhones, Yeti cups, tablets chucked at me right now. As a gunman, is that going to cause some issues? I don't care if I got a pistol, a shotgun, a rifle. Nobody's taking Stanley mugs to the face and it not pissing them off. And about the time I go like this, what should one, two, three, four, five, six, what should y'all do right now? Take me down. Oh, God, I don't know, Chad. That's scary. I might get shot. You may sit here and do nothing and see what happens. You die. You see, they think they're in charge because they have this. They are anticipating no resistance whatsoever. You have to disrupt that mindset a little bit. I'm not advocating you be the hero running around the building chasing the gunman down. I'm saying if he appears and he's right there, you damn well better be ready to do something. Does this make sense? You see, run, hide, fight says fight only as a, see a problem with that? It's a linear approach. Oh, I have to, you mean to tell me if I walk over here to Mark and pull a gun, you mean Mark's going to be like, sir, step out, I need to hide, I need to run. No. Could fighting be the first course of action you take to make sure you go home and see your family at the end of the day? Yes, we fight when our life depends on it. Could it be the first thing I have to do to survive? Yeah, that's a problem with these linear approaches. Also, I want to make sure you understand this. I've never said this before. If you think your seven or ten minute video is training, it's not. That's an awareness video. That is not training. We have to do better. Think back to United Flight 93 on 9-11. A phrase was made famous. What was it? Let's roll. Hijackers overtake the cockpit. Two guys said, we're not going down. Not without a fight, we're not. They rush the cockpit. That plane's headed to D.C. Unfortunately, goes down to Pennsylvania. How many lives were saved that day by two people acting? Thousands. You got to do something. The greatest thing you can have that day, and I know I'm feeding you through a fire hose, but it's the survivor's mindset, the will to survive no matter what. You all have something to live for. You're a husband. You're a wife. You're a mom. You're a dad. You got sprinkles the kitten, I don't know, y'all got something to go home to at the end of the day. And just because you were shot, you are not dead. You understand that? And there's testimonies right here to prove it. If I can breathe, I can fight. If I can breathe, I can render aid to myself. I can try to get away. I can do something. There's a terrible victim mentality across this country right now, and that's got to change. Do not instill into your child or grandchild that they are a victim. You instill into them that I don't care where you came from, how you were raised, what neighborhood you were raised, one parent, two parents. You set your mind to your goal and you go after it. The greatest example I can give of the survivor's mindset for us happened October 2012. 926 that night, our SWAT pagers went off. Yep, 2012, we still carried pagers. Looked like a dope boy at the mall. Said we had a hostage situation. Gave us the address. The address is about seven minutes from where I live. 
I responded up there, and I see all the blue lights, and uh, <clears throat> see all the blue lights, and I, um, and it's the patrol officers that requested our SWAT team, and I'm getting dressed out. There's a single wide trailer that sat on about an acre of land. I'm getting dressed out. I said, what do we have? They said, a guy showed up to this trailer tonight looking for his ex-girlfriend. Knocked on the door, and another guy answered the door. Not a new boyfriend, but a family friend that was over there selling puppies and eating dinner. Lady inside yelled, don't let him in. He went to go shut the door, and when he did, the guy outside had a lever action 30-30 hunting rifle. Shot through the door, forced his way inside, and he's taken hostage. We believe the guy he shot through the door is dead. I turned my comms on. It took about three steps. I said, how many people's in this trailer? He says, the bad guy's in there. The guy he shot, there's a lady in her 60s. There's a lady in her 30s, and there's a little 10-year-old girl in there. Her name's Summer. I said, all right. We deployed out. I put a hostage rescue team on the front corner of the trailer near the front door and a hostage rescue team at the back door. Our breacher placed an explosive charge on the back door that we could blow it. Get in quick, we need to make a rescue. Two snipers across the street, they were useless. All the blinds were pulled, all the lights were off. Negotiators pulled up, finally got the bad guy on the phone, and this is what he said. He said, bring me Summer's sister. Summer's the little 10-year-old girl. Summer's older sister was his ex-girlfriend. That's who he wanted. He says, bring me Summer's sister. He says, when you bring her here, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill myself, but everyone else lives. Y'all pack up and go home. Initially, we figured that when he forced his way in the front of the house, we figured that Summer's sister had probably run out the back door. There's about 80 acres back there, so we had our helicopter and dogs looking for her. Three and a half, almost four hours, that's all he would say. He said, I'm not going to tell you again. Bring me Summer's sister. I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill myself, and then this will all be over with. Three and a half hour mark, negotiations plummeted. Commander came across our comms. Stand by, we got to make a rescue. He gave a countdown. Three, two, one, boom. Door in the back blew. Door on the, door on the front was manually breached. Andy and I were assigned to the entry team up front, and as soon as I stepped through the front door and turned to go down this hallway, I felt boom, boom, boom. Three loudest gunshots I've ever heard in my life coming over my back, and I knew it wasn't coming from us. We were a full-time SWAT team. We shot all the time. I know my gun. I know someone else's gun. I clear a room, and you know in a trailer, like the living room and kitchen's like one big area. And so I'm moving towards the back of this trailer this way, through the kitchen. I see the back door, it's blown. Brad, one of my best friends, he's got his arm up, or his rifle up his arm. He's like, Chad, I'm hit, I'm hit. But it's a hostage rescue. I cannot stop for my guy. I grabbed him by his plate carrier, threw him out the back door, kept going down the hallway, and got right here, and there's a small trailer bathroom. And I heard a scream that I'll never forget. And one of our guys is helping a lady in their 60s out of the bathroom. She's got on green sweatpants, a white t-shirt, she's soaked in blood, helps her out. Lady in her 30s came out, lady in her 20s came out. And one of our guys walks out and he's carrying what appears to be the lifeless body of this little 10-year-old girl in her pajamas. Her hair is all matted from the blood. He walks across the hallway down the bottom of the stairs. <clears throat> outside, he, he turns and he slays that little girl out the grass outside. Suspects down in the bathroom. Jeff, another one of my guys, had taken a 30 caliber round to the hip, disintegrated his femur, clipped his femoral artery, blew out the back of his butt, took another round through the magwell of his M4 up into his neck. It's like controlled chaos. So we have doctors, we have medics assigned to our team. They're working on people. And I was so mad. I said, we got it wrong. Mission failed. There's too many people in this house. And the reason I tell you this story is because for three and a half, almost four hours, summer, that little 10-year-old girl, why don't you pretend this stage right here, this is just the bathtub. She sat on the edge of the tub like this. She's so small that her toes could barely touch the floor of the, from sitting on the tub. She sat on the tub like this. And her mom sat right next to her. Her grandmother was seated on the toilet next to them. And the suspect was four feet away. And what did he keep saying that he wanted? Her sister. You know, at any moment, that little girl could have ended it all. That little 10-year-old girl could have said, you know what, I don't want any part of this. You want my sister? Fine. Stand up, Mom. Pull the shower curtain back. Because her sister was laying in the bathtub behind the shower curtain the entire time. The woman that man wanted was four feet away from him for almost four hours, laying in the tub. You see, Summer, was that little 10-year-old girl was about to get in the bath. And when he forced his way in, the, and she told her sister, lay in the tub, lay in the tub. That little 10-year-old girl pulled the shower curtain and sat in front of it. You see, Summer was shot that night. When we blew the door, that coward turned and shot that little 10-year-old girl first. This past April, my, <clears throat> my wife asked me to go to trivia night at something called a dog bar. Okay, I don't know if y'all have these here. It's hell. Like, there's 100 dogs running around, and you're trying to, like, play trivia and drink a cold beer. So it's just not for me. 
<laughs> there was this big sign that said, happy 21st birthday. And anyway, this girl shows up. They're like, surprise. I'm like, surprise. So I'm getting a drink. And she came. And I said, hey, let me buy you a beer for your birthday. She goes, why did you come to my birthday? How did you know it was my birthday? I said, I have no clue who you are. She's like, you don't? You don't remember me. And I was like, no, I don't. She says, my name's Summer. You saved my life back in 2012. You see, Summer survived. And she survived by the bleeding control training you're going to get today. And what I'm saying is this, if that little 10-year-old girl could have that mindset, each of you in here can too. It's not every day it's tested. There may be blood. It may hurt. But you fight for the end. A bit like this happens, law enforcement's coming. The bat phone gets picked up. County, city, highway, feds. Everybody's coming to your site. Their main job when they get there is to what? When cops get there, what's their job? Eliminate the threat. Take down the shooter. They're going to step over the ginger to find the bad guy. you got to be a good witness. You can't be like, last place we saw him was in HR. They don't know where that is. Help them out. This is a stressful time for them running in. Follow their directions. It may change. Y'all may are barricaded in a room. They pop the door. They tell you to take off running. You in the back, you may be running out, and they tell you to get inside and barricade because they saw something on their approach they didn't like. They're a very fluid event. Don't run and grab at them. I'll tell you a perfect example is of this. Um, we had the opportunity to and, uh, form a relationship um, with, uh, with some families from Stoneman Douglas, staying with Parkland. Right? You understand it slowed the deputies, some of the deputies, from getting into Parkland by like 13 minutes because that they – these kids are running out of, of Stoneman Douglas, the worst event they've ever seen in their life. And that badge was the first sign of Savior. And they were grabbing, God, help us. Don't grab at them. Every second's another life. Let the law enforcement get in do their job. And then help uh, keep hands visible. I don't want to run out of a building with dark, linear objects in my hand. Could this look like something else? So keep hands open and visible. If the cops tell you to hit the deck, what do you do? EMS and fire is coming too. Look at me. You could have two ambulances in front of your building when this kicks off. They're not coming in until law enforcement says it's safe for them to do so. Average response time for EMS to make it into an active shooter event on average across this country is about 25 minutes. How fast do I bleed out from an arterial wound? Two to four, three to five. I suck at math, but if it takes EMS 25 and it takes, and I'm to get in and it takes me three to five to bleed out, who's the paramedic now? You are. The United States Secret Service did a study that said approximately, look at me, approximately half of the people who have died in active shooter events would be alive today if someone in the workplace knew how to stop their bleeding. Half. That's why the bleeding control portion is so important. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you have bleeding control kits on site at your facility. And I'm not talking about your CentOS tweezers. Awesome. We'll talk more about that. EMS comes in, take directions, become an assistant. Now, I don't need you being like, hey, I was a Boy Scout in 81. Where do you need me? That's not what I'm talking about. But after today, everyone in here will know how to stop bleeding on all areas of the body. Our recommendation, and there's a, um, more information, and we can talk about it later, uh, from what's called the Hartford Consensus on the importance of having bleeding control kits on site and in cars. We'll talk about it. Let them work and then help with evacuations when it's safe to do so. All right? So... The aftermath, nobody ever, see, that's the difference between our company and anyone else. And this isn't a sales pitch, I'm just telling you. So many organizations come in and just focus on what to do during the event. They don't talk about how to prevent it, possibly, by the recognition of early warning signs or the aftermath. There has to be reunification. There's a difference between having rally points and reunification. A rally point, right? If there's a fire at the building, we all go outside to the flagpole and we meet. Is that where we go if there's an active shooter event? Say no. Where do you go? Yeah, it should look like the casting call to Forrest Gump. Like, run, run, run. You're a mile down the road, go into the local watering hole, get a beer. But there has to be a point where leadership knows there's, their people are accounted for. So how are you going to do that? You guys work inside and install and do things and monitor places that have thousands of employees. So how... If all of a sudden I'm at some manufacturing plant, and there was a, how do I account for my people? I mean, it really started, think about Facebook, right? The check-in safe from the hurricanes. Like mobile apps, systems like Everbridge, where you can check in safe is what you need. Um, think about some of your facilities. 
does, does anyone in here, I don't know a lot of these are like smaller, do any of y'all like uh, work in places that, or, or monitor places that have like 300 employees? All right, sir, imagine this. What's your name? Farshid. Hi, right, Farshid, I'm Chad. Imagine this. <clears throat> Put this at your, at your place of business, whatever. Active shooter event happens tomorrow at, at a place where you monitor or, or do whatever. Pissed off employee goes in there and shoots and kills 21 people. 21 are dead throughout the plant and five are injured. How long does that location shut down as a crime scene? Weeks. Weeks, I'd agree with that. It's not a month. Shut down, not coming in to move IT equipment, not coming in to get your Louis Vuitton bag that you left or your car keys. Shut down, crime scene. How long will it take for the parties involved, Farshid, to come back to work? Not the injured, watch this. Ladies and gentlemen, you were there the day the event happened. Three weeks later, Farshid sends an email, we're opening back up on Monday. When you were running out of the building, you stepped over your injured or dead friends and coworkers. Raise your hand if you're walking back out of that building. You understand some places never do reopen. They're torn down, turned into a crime scene. That section of, of Stoneman Douglas still is not opened up. Because guess what? Just because ServPro came in here and put new carpet, painted everything, just because it's clean in here doesn't mean it's clean up here, does it? And we all grieve differently. I was involved in five shootings in my career. Three of them were fatal. I buried it for years. That's why counseling is so important. I never talked about it. So two years ago when my wife sent me off to Junction, Texas for two and a half weeks to go get help, to process what I saw. Do not bury trauma. Have things in place and resources in place to help your team and to help others through traumatic events. You still got those customers though, right? Business continuity. Most of your customers have business continuity. You probably have business continuity plans. Fire, inclement weather, cyber attacks, do they include active shooter events? I don't want to know what it would cost if some of your largest accounts got shut down or your place got shut down for a month. Let me ask you this. I want you to raise your hand or, or just answer out loud. What employees should go through this training? Does everyone agree with that? The OSHA general duty clause states you'll provide a safe work environment free from any and all recognizable hazards to all employees. That's what the courts are citing in these lawsuits after the event. For failing, because a lot of companies are like, yeah, my, my C-suite or my safety guy went through an active shooter class. That's fine. You understand this. Uh, what's your name? Allie? Allie, we're gonna like role play here for a second, all right? Allie, uh, you are my wife. You are, the, you are the receptionist, I answered the phones for Barb here. You were killed in the active shooter event. I'm going to come forward and I'm going to say, hey, Barb, um, I'm Chad. My wife is Allie, as you know. Um, did you guys provide active shooter training here? Well, some of my team, my, my safety guys and some of my C-suite went through active shooter training. No, 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 that's not what I asked. Did Allie? Your C-suite's life is valued higher than the young lady. That you is that discriminatory? Shake your head yes, because the courts have already ruled on that. Take the money, take the, take that out of it. The, well, the average payout to a victim's family of an active shooter event across the country. Anybody want to know per victim? Ten what? Ten million. Ten to twelve million per victim. Your general liability does not cover active shooter events, or most of them don't. Something to look into. All right. Any questions? All right. We're going into medical. Andy, good to go? Let's hit medical PowerPoint. I'm going to hit this fast because I really want y'all to do it hands-on. Most important part we're going to talk about today. Three categories of injuries. Category number one, Brian. Brian, you go, are, are you staying here tonight? You're not? You're going back? You're staying in the area. All right. Brian tonight's going to go out with some of y'all to the event. He's going to have a few too many martinis. He's going to trip, leaving the bar, he's going to skin his knee. Will that kill him? No. Wet paper cloth, door of the Explorer, Band-Aid, kiss on the knee, he's good to go. All right? Ma'am, how are you? You decide to walk out on the interstate tonight, stand in the middle lane, and let an 18-wheeler hit you. 
at 90 miles an hour. You understand, I don't care what trauma team's standing by when that happens. We can't put you back together, correct? So category one, no matter what you live. Category two, no matter what you die. I want to focus on the area in the middle. If you do something, they will live. If you don't do something, they will die. Colonel Sin said it best. He said, the fate of the wounded rests with those who apply the first dressing. That was in the late 1800s. Does that apply today? What you do, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely can make the difference between someone living and dying. So I'll talk about preventable causes of death. That's bleeding control, breathing, and airway. I'm really focusing on bleeding control today. All right, we're not talking about breathing and airway. We're not talking about asthma or COPD. We're talking about trauma to the chest. Three types of bleeding, capillary. That was Brian. Capillary bleeding will not kill you. Bright red blood doesn't kill you. Then you get that dark color that's venous. Usually with some direct pressure, it's going to clot itself in about five minutes. But what I'm focusing on is arterial. Bright red spurting blood, that'll kill you in how long? Three to five, two to four minutes. Exactly. We've got to stop that. We've got to keep the red stuff in the body. Ways that I'm going to teach you today, direct pressure using a pressure bandage, tourniquets, and wound packing. That's the three ways I'm going to teach you today. Everything I teach you today, everything I show you today is in the bleeding control kit. That's why it's so important. And he's got a small cut to his arm. It's not arterial, but I need to get some good pressure on it. I take my um, pressure bandage. It's like an ace wrap with an absorbent pad. I start and I place the absorbent pad on there. All right, Andy, hold that for me. Thank you, Andy. And I start to wrap. I'm going to wrap this directly. Good, I got it from there. I'm wrapping directly on top of the wound. I'm wrapping above the wound, back on top, but I also want to wrap below the injury as well. And there's some really sticky Velcro. Oh, it's stuck right there. That's how sticky it is. All right, and I'll hold it there. Now, I'm holding it tight. I may have to leave him. If I have to leave him, have him hold pressure. But if I come back and he's bleeding through this, is this working? So what do we need to go to? Tourniquet, good. Raise your hand if you've had tourniquet training. All right, several of y'all. Raise your hand if you've had tourniquet training in the last five years. Okay. So some of what I'm probably going to tell you today, some of you that may have tourniquet training like back in like the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even the 90s, it's people were so afraid of tourniquets, right? Oh, gosh, if you put a tourniquet on, they're going to lose that limb or it's going to cause nerve damage. That data came from World War II, where men were left out in the field for eight days before they got to a hospital. Tourniquets are safe, all right? Commercial tourniquets. Tourniquets use circumferential pressure to collapse down on the veins and arteries and tissue on extremities to stop blood flow. Tourniquets are safe. Say it. They only go on extremities, arms and legs. They go here, 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 and here. All right, not here. <laughs> Weird stuff, stay away from that, all right? Three things I need you to remember. Tourniquets go as high as possible, as tight as possible, as fast as possible. High, tight, and fast, don't forget it. I'm going to demonstrate real quick. All right, leave your tourniquets. Do not touch your tourniquets, please. Here is how the tourniquet is set up in your kit. I grab this loop right here with the red tip on it, all right? You're going to do this in a second, but I'm just going to grab that loop with the red tab. I sling it open, all right? I've got to make sure all the Velcro is open. If it doesn't fully open up, put your injured arm in there. Make sure all the Velcro. The most important part today, guys, is that red tip. That red tip right there faces towards my heart. Right now, it's facing away from me. All right, guys, please, please, please set your tourniquets down. I'm not trying to be a jack-a, but it'll all make sense. Would y'all say right now the red tip's pointed towards me or away from me? You see, if it's away from me and I slide it up, I can't pull my tourniquet that way. Red tip towards me, I can. So I slide it up. How high up? High as I can. High up in the armpit. Peel. I, you notice that once it's up high, I'm not letting it drop. I'm taking the slack out and almost pulling that red tab across my body. I peel that red tab up and get it in my hand, punch it across, tight, lean over and grab immediately right next to that buckle. You got me? Now, work this like a ratchet strap one time. Up, down, cinch it, wrap it around and stop right before that little clip right there. Take your rod out, your, your stick, whatever you want to call it, and start turning it. Now is when the tourniquet's getting very tight. Don't overthink this. 
How many times do we turn this? Till what stop? Till the bright red bleeding stops. That's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do. Not till it hurts. Tourniquets hurt. Secure it back in place. Pull the excess fabric through. Time stamp comes over the top. We do get questions about time stamp. I'm not worried about writing the time down in the civilian setting. American College of Surgeons says the safe time to leave a tourniquet on without neuromuscular damage, need for amputation, is two hours. Guess what? Can I get to a hospital more than likely in two hours? If it takes three or four hours, okay, if I have a little bit of nerve damage, what did I not lose? My life, I'll trade it out. Tourniquets go on arms and legs. They go what? All right, I've never had to apply two tourniquets to an arm. I have had to apply two tourniquets to a leg. If you have to apply a second tourniquet, try to go higher. Let's say it's on your leg. Go higher if you can. If you can't, go right next to it. Don't overlap them. Don't crisscross them. Got it? Andy. All right, so now we're going to go to the areas of the body that we cannot get tourniquets. They're called your junctional areas. And as we look at our junctional areas, what I'm talking about is high on the shoulders, front and back, pelvic girdle, and your butt. And in those areas, what we're going to do is we're going to pack those wounds, all right? Now, this is a picture of the wound trainers. Y'all are going to go hands-on with this in just a second. So I'm going to go quick right now. With wound packing, all we're doing is creating pressure from the inside, right? And reason being, you can see up here on the board right now, if you have an injury that goes in, through, and out, if you were just to put direct pressure on both sides of that, what would still be happening in here? Bleeding, right? So we've got to create the pressure from the inside. Inside your bleeding control kit, there's gauze designed for packing wounds, and you're going to take that gauze and cram it into those wounds. I don't know how many rolls of gauze it's going to take. We're going to put as much gauze as we can fit in there until we cannot physically fit anything else, and then we're going to hold direct pressure on that, all right? So <clears throat> what if you don't have any gauze? Could you improvise and use other things for that? Cloth items, T-shirts, socks, clothing. Uh, the thing on your, your table there is synthetic, right? It'll work. It won't be as good as like a cotton undershirt or a pair of socks, but it'll work. We stay away from paper products because if I pack with tissue paper, toilet paper, magazine paper, what happens when it gets saturated with blood? It falls apart. It's a waste of my time, all right? So we're going to go hands-on with that in just a few minutes here. But that is wound packing. Again, the areas of the body that we pack wounds, shoulders, front and back, pelvic girdle and butt. All right, now we're talking about breathing real quick. As Chad mentioned, we're not talking about the breathing that you talked about in your CPR class. We're talking about breathing as it relates to a traumatic injury to the chest from a gunshot wound. So the first thing that we want to look at here is we want to place our patient in a position of comfort. All right? Now, when I first started going through this training, I was told, listen, if somebody's shot in the chest, lay them down first so you can get them nice and calm and you can evaluate them. That could be very bad for their breathing, all right? Allow them to find the position where they can breathe the best. If they're alert and conscious, let them find that spot. They'll do it naturally, but don't make them lay down. Then we are going to want to seal open wounds, collarbone to belly button, all the way around, okay? Collarbone to belly button, all the way around. We seal with a chest seal from our bleeding control kit. So the first thing you're going to have to do is expose their skin. A chest seal cannot go on top of clothing. It needs to go directly on bare skin. Man, woman, old, young, don't care. It has to go on bare skin in order for it to work. You'll find some gauze in there. Wipe the area clear with the gauze. You're going to find a pad in here. This pad has adhesive on one side. It's really sticky. You put the sticky side down. You try and put the center of the pad in the center of the injury, and you press it down. Now, these come in two packs. Why do you think they come in two packs? Front, back, sides, multiple injuries, right? Um, on TV, bullet holes always go like here and here, and they're like perfectly straight lines. How often do you think that happens in real life? Not very often, right? So we want to make sure that we're looking all the way around. Collarbone to belly button is going to get a chest seal. Now, chest seals, too, you could improvise if you needed to. Here's why we do a chest seal. Because we've got to stop air from going into that wound. If air is going in there, instead of going in your mouth and your nose, it can kill you. All right, we've got to stop the air from going in there as quickly as possible. If we put that seal on there, it basically creates a one-way valve. As they breathe in... It sucks down, preventing the air from going in. Now the air goes in their mouth and their nose again. As they breathe out, there's vents on the chest seal that allow anything that's in there already to come out. If you improvise, this is an improvised chest seal right here. You can see it's a piece of cellophane. Anything that keeps air from going through it will work. You'll also notice it is taped on three sides instead of four to allow for what's called burping the wound so that you can 
open it if they start to have difficulty breathing and allow things to escape if it needs to. All right, chest seal's pretty simple. Put the sticky thing on their chest. Clearing the airway. I'm going to hit this fast um, because most of you had CPR class. Look for foreign objects in their mouth, whether it's broken bones or whatever from the, the bullet. We've got to take it out so their airway's open. We need to make sure that the tongue and the muscles in the, the mouth and the throat are not laying on the back of the airway, closing the airway. Two ways we can do that very easily, you can simply lift their chin up, all right? If you're afraid of a neck or spinal cord injury, push behind their jaw and force the bottom part of their jaw forward, lifting that up from the back, all right? I know that was quick, but does anybody have any questions on the airway? If I need to leave somebody, I'll leave them in what's called the rescue or the recovery position. You can see he's on his side, his top leg and his top arm are in front of him for a kickstand to prevent him from rolling forward. We don't want him on his back and we don't want him laying face down in whatever might be coming out of his mouth. This also gives first responders a good signal. And that signal is that this person had a sign of life. Somebody saw that they were alive and started to help them. So as those first responders are starting to enter, if they see somebody who's just piled up on the floor and nobody's touched them, there's no sign of life there. Are they going to stop and help that person? They're going to move on. But if they see this guy here, they're going to realize, all right, he was alive at one point. We need to go help him. Now, I know that was super fast. I need you all to review with me real quick, and then Chad's going to come back up on stage. As we do this review, the answers are actually on the board, so you can cheat if you want to. But the areas of blue, if I have an injury and I'm bleeding, what am I going to do? All right, and Chad asked for three things. There were three important things he asked you to remember. They go... Y'all say them together. They go, hi. Awesome. Now let's look at the areas of gray. Shoulders, pelvic girdle, and butt. I call them your junctional areas. What method of treatment am I using there? Wound packing. What do I use to pack those wounds? Gauze. If I don't have gauze, I can improvise. Areas of white, collarbone to belly button, all the way around. Chest seals. That has to go directly on the what? Bare skin. Does anybody have any questions on medical? All right, so we're going to put the PowerPoint away for a second, and then Chad's going to come up, and he's going to talk in more detail about defending your workplace and what to do with the gun if you get it away. Bring it up. You want to hear again? Yeah, no, let's slide it. Uh, yeah. You find yourself in an active shooter situation. What's the main goal again? Survive. You're in your primary workspace, all right, and you hear what you believe to be gunfire. What's the first thing you need to do? Before you run. Before that. What'd you say? Is where the gunfire is determine what your best course of action is that day? Right? If we're in this room right now and someone ran and said, there's a gunman on the second floor murdering people, am I going to tell y'all, guys, let's shut, lock, barricade, and stay in this room? Nope. Bye. Where the gunfire is determines what your best course of action is. Two words I need you to remember today. Cover and concealment. Cover and concealment. Cover. Something you can get behind that will stop a bullet. Engine block of a car, brick wall, concrete pillar, um, crib, and, sorry. <laughs> the word cover means it will stop a bullet. The other C word, concealment. Um, sir, if you were to get under this table right now, you don't have to. If you got under the table with this cloth, I can't see you, correct? But does it stop a bullet? So that's concealment. So what's better? Cover or concealment? Cover. cover because it. All right, so again, we're going back to my door. Remember, this is my door. Doors, cover or concealment? Is that going to stop a bullet? So it, concealment. 99.9% .9 of doors are not covered. They don't stop bullets. 2010, my partner was shot right next to me through a door. He was my breacher. He's ramming the door. I'm running point on the other side of the door, waiting on the door to open up to make entry. Bad guy inside, shot through the door. Dropped him right there next to me. That's why when cops come to your house, they're not like, police department, right? Where do they stand? Yeah, you all have had a lot of cops come to your house, it sounds like. <laughs> what I'm saying is this. If you choose to barricade your office or that room, minimize the time spent in front of the door because it's not going to stop a bullet. All right? There's none in here, so we're going to pretend. Let's just say windows. Cover or concealment? It's a trick question. Are windows good or bad? They're both ways. All right, Miss Barb, tell me why windows are good. I can use them as an escape route. I love it. Why else are windows good, Barb? Why else are they good? I can see where the bad guy is. Exactly. Why are windows bad, Ralph? 
They can see you, right? Your creepy neighbor. They can see through them. They can shoot through them. They're both. If you're able to make it out of a window to get away, I don't want you just aimlessly running through the parking lot, right? You want to use points of cover. Good, all right? Points of cover. Have we not seen an increase of attacks from elevated positions? That's a position of advantage, right? So what I'm saying is you're at a ball game Friday night, a concert Saturday. You need to be, think, think back to the shooting in Vegas, right? Where was he at? Elevated position, position of advantage. Andy and I were out in Vegas not too long after it, and we were looking. I was like, man, can you imagine? Because you understand those people out there at the Route 60 or whatever concert, they never heard that gunfire for an extended period of time. So you need to be looking and say, where's the closest? You come into a room. Where's the closest place of cover I can get to if crap goes down, okay? So, again, this is my office. <clears throat> Here's my door that leads out to the hallway, all right? My desk is right here. And, like, my window to lead outside is right here, all right? All of a sudden, I hear gunfire in the hallway. It's close by. First thing I want to do is what to the door? Shut and lock. Step number one. Guys, get locks on doors. Minimal cost, high payoff. Locks on all doors. Shut and lock the door. Step number one. What's step number two? Barricade. Set up your offices where it's easy to barricade. You go into clients' offices. You know, you always go. All, we go, Andy and I are in people's offices all the time, all across the country. And they're all set up the same, Right? Two chairs in front of the desk, boss man's desk, bookshelf behind the desk, got the family portrait, beach photos, all the, you know, pastel, lily, flitzer dresses, all right? But how in the world are you going to lug all that stuff over there to the door under stress to barricade it? You all admitted this could happen, so set up offices where it's easy to barricade. Instead of having certain heavy objects behind your desk, have them by the door so you can put your butt up against it and drop it down. Make sense? So we shut, we lock, we barricade, we want to find an improvised Improvised weapon and look for a way out. Our, our windows, Miss Barb just said it. Windows ways out. All right, how are you going to get through the window in your office? Throw a chair. We're down here in Florida. What are your windows rated for? Throw a chair up against the window. It's good. What, what's it going to do? Bounce right back at you. Hopefully it was caught on that camera back there. You get some likes on Barstool Sports or something. I don't know. Windows are harder to get through than you think. It's going to take a heavy, blunt object, that fire extinguisher, Big Brian's arms, it looks like, all right? I tell people all the time, if you work in an office with a window and you're on the first or second floor, spend $9, go to Home Depot, get a mini sledgehammer, stays in your top desk drawer. HR wants to know why, it's because you hung those pictures up in your office, all right? But now I have a weapon and a means of escape. Remember, you hit windows in the what parts to break them? Corners, good, not the middle, the strongest in the middle, all right? But if you don't have a window in your office, what's another way out? Drywall, drop tile ceiling, all right? Maybe I know you and my partner next door, you, you work next door, you got a window, I'll drop into your office. Hey, dude, this guy next door with a gun, can we use your window to get out? What it should not look like that day is this. Hey, guys, uh, called y'all in for this big, what in the world was that? I opened the door, I'm like, oh, crap, y'all, there's a guy with a gun. Guy with a gun, oh, gosh, Greg, under the table. Let's pray, our Father which art in heaven. Like, I agree, there should be some praying. Have I made it perfectly clear to you today why in an active shooter bit you do not get under your desk or huddle together? Do you at least get that? Does anyone want to debate me on this, please? Ain't nobody else get embarrassed. This is the only time my, I don't have kids, but this would be the only time my child could disrespect their teacher. You try to shove my kid in a closet in the back of the room or under a table, you're going to get a seven-year-old that looks at you and goes, get bent, I'm going out the window. And I'll deal with that later. Do not allow your child to be a victim. I beg you. What it should look like that day is this. Hey, guys, listen, I called you. What the heck was that? Hey, there's a guy with a gun. Hey, start moving the furniture over there. You, bust the window out. Guys, with me if he comes in. In a matter of about five seconds, what did I just do? I devised a, is it fair to say if this happens tomorrow or next week whenever you get back to work, some pissed off employee comes in there and just starts blasting people. For most of you in this room, will it be the most stressful thing you've probably ever been in in your life? Do we all handle stress differently? Sure. I mean, think about it. <clears throat> maybe, what's your name, Rick? Rick, maybe in a situation like that, you can be the leader, you take charge, you handle it well. All right? Skip, you may freeze. Mark, you may vomit. Josh, you may pee yourself. Like, these are all reactions I've seen happen to the body under stress you have no control over. Like I said, every one of my shootings I was involved in, my body handled them all differently. Whether it was I fell asleep, for two days, 
whether I was up for two days, whether I don't remember, whether I only heard the, the shell casing sit in the ground. The body's weird. The body handles stress very weird. But let me ask, out of those of you I just named, who am I the most concerned with? The one that what? The one that froze. Who was that? Skip. Skip's in what we call condition black. So Andy went through Cooper's colors earlier. Remember it? Condition white. White, yellow, orange, red. All right. There's one more called condition black where, where Rick's trying to coordinate stuff and you're running and, and Skip's just like he, he, he doesn't know what to do. And the reason it's called condition black, anyone ever passed out before? Raise your hand. Anybody? No, not from drinking. I mean from, I'm no, just kidding. When you passed out, Kevin, it gets black from where? The outside and it closes in. That's why it's called condition black. What's the best way to get Skip out of that freeze mode? And it's not to slap him. I know. What's a better way? What'd you, Dan, right? Call him by name and give him a job. Skip, throw that at him if he comes in. Skip, run. I've taken him out of this, I've got the wheels turning. I said, I'm the oldest of four boys. We grew up fighting. That's how you handled stuff. My mom sent our butts outside. Y'all handle it. Boom, boom, boom. I hate you. I hate you too. Five minutes later, we're back what? Playing baseball again, right? Ladies a little bit different. Hold grudges for about six years, but whatever. All right? I love to fight. You want to fight? We'll fight. I, I teach Krav Maga. Pletch in the back, he's a great jiu-jitsu guy. Like, I love to fight. You want to fight, we'll fight. I love it. You know what I don't like? The build-up to a fight. The right beforehand. Who, who remembers that? Stand up real quick. You ever had a fight growing up after school? Yeah, come over here real quick. Hurry, 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 hurry. No, I'm not. <laughs> Grab a seat. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline to be no, just kidding. You're in <laughs> You're in 11th grade eating your square pizza, scoop of corn. I walk over to you at the cafeteria. I say, 2.30, meet me across the street. I walk off. What's his heart start doing right now? God, what did it say about him? Say, oh, God. 1.30, over another hour. Then 2.30, stand up. We meet across the street. Oh, you're actually a very big dude. All right. <laughs> this is going to be fun. All right. What's the first two minutes look like? Like this, right? Your mom, your sister. Like, what are we waiting on? What are we waiting on? Boom. I'm waiting on the first punch. Thank you, Frankie. After the first punch is thrown, are you thinking about the buildup of the fight anymore? What are you thinking about? Winning, surviving, whipping his ass, whatever you want to call it. My question to you is this. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you think an active shooter event is not the same thing? Raise your hand if at some point today during our presentation you think your blood pressure might have gone up a point or two thinking about this happening in your kid's school or your business. Awesome. Take an aspirin. This is what you have to understand. When the gunfire kicks off at your facility, there's no being the be little bewitched lady wiggling your nose and disappearing. You're in it. It's going to suck. You've got to embrace the suck. Imagine being the company or the school or the business who has no training in place whatsoever. What do you think it looks like when the event happens? It's called mass what? When do you think our company gets the most phone calls? Right after major events. Same thing here. And I'm not being mean to you guys because I told you, Andy and I even said it. We offend people, but we tell the truth because I care about you. A lot of you are going to be, man, gosh, we need this. And I will never hear from anyone in this room. And again, it's not a sales thing. It's just, but guess what? Let an event happen at the business next to you, and guess whose cards you're going to start looking for? It just is what it is. I've been in this business long enough. I understand how it works. So you shut, you locked, you barricade, and you can't get out of your building. you got to be ready to what? And fighting could be your what course of action? We're going to pretend over here. Make sure you can see this little... This is my door, just for training purposes, this is my door. The door opens this way, all right? So to defend my office, I don't want to be behind the door, right? People say, be behind the door. No, I'm trapped. I want to be right here. And all of a sudden, I'm like, y'all get ready. And all of a sudden, the gunman appears, and I'm getting my hands on this gun. Y'all are looking at me, like, you want me to grab a gun? I can't make you do this. I just ask if you sit over there in the corner and do nothing, what happens? You die. Well, Chad, it's not natural to grab a gun. It's not natural to show up to your business murdering people. This person's not natural. He's got mental illness. He's crazy, and I'm going to do something. When Chris came through the door, I'm targeting this. This is what's doing the killing, all right? My outside hand, would you all not agree this is my outside hand to Chris, came under the gun. My hand closest, my arm closest to Chris goes on top of the gun, not the wrist, the gun. Everyone say both hands on the gun. Both hands on the gun. All right, I grab this. He's probably going to do two things. What's the first one? Pull the trigger. Bang. Good. Whew, boss man, I'm trying. 
Tandy's over here giving me my time. All right. He pulls the trigger. Bang. And is it possible we start wrestling over this? Is that okay? Yeah. Because right about now, all right, if we're wrestling over this, what should 90 of y'all do right now? Some of y'all in the back are like, heck no, I'm out. But some of y'all here, would you not all agree that, sir, by yourself, Chris is a big dude. But if I'm wrestling it, if you came and bear hugged his knees and pulled it, do you think you could get Chris to the ground? Exactly. Oh, here, now, let me ask you this. Go. If 10 of y'all jumped on him, could we get him to the ground? It's over. What if I'm by myself? What do I do to him? Kick him where? Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> nope. Kick him. Bite him. Whatever. But here's his weak. Chris is a big dude, but he's weak in the wrist. That's what I'm trying to focus on. I'm driving the back of this slide straight down into his wrist. So when I grab this, notice his body starts. Chris is strong. All right? I'm not lying. Chris is a strong guy. But even there, his body starts to break down. I'm defeating this. I'm driving that. And when this gun, when the barrel gets up, pretend there's a sword and I'm cutting Chris on the top of his head down to the bottom of the seat. Drive it down, stripping it away. That's why I don't grab the wrist, because that's bracing the wrist. I'm trying to defeat the wrist, taking it away. Now, also, a couple things. I grab this. He pulls the trigger. It goes bang. Right? How many times? Only once. Why? I prevented the slide from cycling back, ejecting the shell casing. What's inside? He pulls the trigger. He's getting how many rounds off? One. Because I prevented the slide from cycling back. There's a spent shell casing. The gun's jammed at this point. How many active shooter events could have? And people are like, Chad, the gun will be hot. Do you think you'll feel that? It's two pounds of pressure. I've done it with my thumb. This slide, this is a machine, correct? It's fully got to do its job to work. Now, you understand, so, so this gun is jammed. You understand the initial round in the chamber will go off, though, correct? So I can't take it away this way, right? That's messing. Drive it towards him, taking it away. Does that make sense? Now, you understand, there's a difference between a robbery and an active shooter. You're at the ATM, and I say, give me your wallet and keys. What do you do? Here, yeah. Here, 030 on the truck, my ex-wife max the AMX is out, right? Two different things. Active shooter, they want your life, they don't get it. Also, I need to make sure a discrepancy right here, a disclaimer. I'm not joking around. Everyone look at me right now. You do not go home and practice this with a real gun. Does everyone understand? I'm not joking. Yes? Awesome. What if he has a rifle or a shotgun? What do you do? Someone say the same thing. Exactly. Is it harder or easier? Because I have what? Leverage. I'm behind a cubicle. He appears. It's the same motion. I'm not grabbing it. I'm using my momentum to drive up on the barrel, down on the stock. It's that way. And now I'll take this away and I'll beat that big old head of his. All right? Come below. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's the same thing. It's easier. 26 people dead, 22 injured at a church shooting in Texas about two and a half, three years ago. Set up like this, row of pews, aisle, row of pews. 26 dead, 22 injured. That means at some point he had to what? How does that happen? Nobody did anything. You have to do something. What would have happened if a 10-year-old boy on the back row would have gone like this? No! What do you think his mom would have done at that point? Dad, preacher man, you got to do something. Make sense? All right, that's what I need. Uh, here. You got me too, Andy? Mark, come on up here. No? All right. Fine. Come on up. Come, come on up here. Sure. All the way to the front. Well, my dad told me to eat my peas, and I still don't do it. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hold this gun for me. For the sake of training, wrap your finger because it'll break, Michael. Don't, don't, don't desperate. Just hold it. Grab it and freeze, Brant. Don't take it. Just grab it and freeze. Yep, just stay here. All right, when I tell you to, 5%, don't break the man's wrist. But you're going to rock it. You're going to step towards him, face him, and drive it down his body when I tell you to. Like 5%. Grab it and freeze. Stay here. <clears throat> sir, 911, what's your emergency? We have a what? What's your address, sir? All right, is your shooter male or female? Uh, black, white, Asian, Hispanic. Uh, what color shirt? Hurry, sir. 
Sounds good. Law enforcement's on the way. Strip the gun. Take it away. Take it away. He takes the gun away. And guess who enters the room? Law enforcement. Law enforcement responding. To, that's, that's the cops responding to the white guy with the white shirt with the gun. Oh, crap. Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you think law enforcement is justified in taking the shot on Brant the first chance they get. How many of you think that he should have, the cop should have said, drop the gun, drop the gun? Anybody? You think they should have told him to drop the gun? No, we give verbal commands if feasible. I'm not giving him the chance to take another shot. If you don't have a uniform on you or anything like that, I'm taking a shot on you. But here's the thing. Hold that for me. Is it possible he's running, you're running? Whew. You're 20 yards behind, uh, in front of him, and you heard gunshots. You look back, and you saw a dark object in his hand. You got outside. We got a shooter, black male, navy shirt, navy pants, and the dispatcher's going, no, no, we're getting a call about the white guy with the white shirt. What I'm saying is when law enforcement shows up, they're not looking for gender, race, sex, age. What are they looking for? All right, thank you, gentlemen. So what do you do if you get the gun? All right. What's he going to do? Any other options? All right, sir, give me one second while I dismantle this gun. <laughs> Shooting, we'll get there in a second. All right, power and what? Is this an option? I told you today it's all about options. We're struggling, and you three gentlemen tackle Chris to the ground. I slide this across the room, and we hold him down to the cops get here. Is that an option? I strip this out of his hand, and you grab your, you grab your lanyard, you choke him out. He goes unconscious. I throw the gun in the ceiling. We all survive and get away. Is that an option? I strip this gun out of his hand. I run outside to give this to the cops when they get here. <laughs> Bad option. All right, so someone said it. If I strip this gun, I probably caused a mal. So I know how to clear a malfunction. If I strip this and I cap rack, right, cap rack, dump two in his face and say, go, let's go, go. Can I do that, yes or no? Raise your hand if you say I'm justified in doing that. Oh, this is where it gets so weird with me. All right, oh, God, how do I answer? Bob's going to get mad. Well, let me ask you something. Three hours from now, you're going to turn on the news. It's going to say you shot a. Did you shoot an unarmed man at that point? Yes or no? Why is he unarmed? Well, let me ask you something. As quick as I do this, could he knock me out and take the gun, and now he's back killing people in your business? Just as fast as I do this, what else could he do? Do what? Oh, crap. How many active shooters show up with just one gun and one magazine of ammo? Very few. If you're asking Chad Ayers what I do in this situation, I'm going to strip the gun, I'm cap rocking, I'm dumping two in his face to end it. That's me. Time out. I am not here telling anyone in this room you have to take a life. That is not a decision for me or anyone on our team to make. That's a personal decision. Is it an option? I can use deadly force to protect myself and the lives of Is it possible? Huh? <laughs> and let me ask you something, Richard. Is it possible you're still taken downtown and interviewed? Is it possible the cops still say, hey, I need to talk to you downtown? And they read you your rights and you say, thank you. I'm not, I, I don't care what you do that day, ladies and gentlemen. I don't. As long as he stops killing people, that's all I care about. Does that make sense? You have to do something. Dismissing it, saying this can't be happening doesn't work. This is what I need everyone to do. Stand up, push your chairs in, and stay where you're at. Stand up, push your chairs in, and stay where you're at. What's going to happen is you're going to have an instructor come in front of you. Come back on stage, sir. Is there a gun over here? No, I'll take this. Guys, we're going to have instructors come down the rows. All right? If you would, too, if there's empty seats beside you, push them in for us. The instructor's going to come in front of your table. You're going to grab the gun. Look at me. Do not try to show off. You will hurt our instructor's wrist. 5% effort. Hand under, hand on top. Your outside hand is under, your inside hand on top. Rock it back. When the barrel is straight up, drive it down. Once you take the gun, set it on the table. Do not hand the gun back to the bad guy. That's a bad muscle memory. All right? We're, so instructors are going to come down the road. After you've taken the gun, grab a seat. Got it? Awesome. All right, young lady, you ready? So that hand under. Yes, ma'am. That one on top. Now rock it. Keep rocking. Keep rocking. Now drive that hand straight down. Take it away. Hard. Boom. Perfect. That's it. Set it right there. Good job. Ready? Under. Top. Rock it. 
drive it. Perfect. Good. Set it there. You're good. Drive it. Yes. Perfect. Sorry. Set. You're good. Perfect. Set it there. Drive. Drive. Perfect. Good job. Drive. Now. Drive down. That. There we go. Perfect. All right. Good. It's all about finding that leverage. Under. Stop. Drive. Perfect. Good job. Set it there. Good, Mark. Drive. Perfect. Set it there. You're good. Yeah, 5% effort, guys. Set it there. If you've already taken it away, I'm coming by. Boom. All right, so more hand here. Drive this hand. Now down. Down. Hard. There you go. Good. You're good. Thank you. Yes. Ready? Perfect. I've done this like 40 million times. Good. Perfect. Drive. Perfect. Set it there. All right, stop. Under. Now, where does that hand need to go? There you go. Now, does that make sense? You're going to set it right there. Good. You're good. You want to do it? I'll do it. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, I like it. Gentlemen, have y'all gone over here? Have y'all gone? All right, grab a seat for me. Please do not open the tourniquets, guys. Do not open your tourniquets. Have y'all gone? All right, more hand here. Good. Grab under. On top. Now. Yeah. Now, when it gets there, drive that hand straight down. Yes, that's it. Good. Boom. Got him. I like it. I like the triple tap. Under. Yeah. And it'll probably be at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Awesome. All right. I'm about to bring Andy up. Ladies and gentlemen, you understand the chances you ever find yourself in an active shooter situation is very small. You can get away, get away. If you can't get away, you shut, you lock, you barricade, but you better be ready to what? Huh? Some of y'all have put systems in place, right? Or, or, or like these like things up in the ceiling right here. What are those? Sprinklers, right? Where do they there? Do they put those sprinklers in, hoping this place catches on fire? Then why are they there? Just then. I hope you never have to use this training that I just showed you. But should the active shooter event happen, you're that fire suppression unit. It's like putting your seatbelt on. You don't do it hoping you wrap your car around the telephone pole. You do it to be prepared in case. Andy, they're all yours. Sorry, my mic wasn't on. All right, so you got your tourniquet up there in front of you. You can see that it's got three loops the way that it's set up. One loop's got the plastic stuff on it. Then you got the middle. And then you've got this outside loop here that's got that red tab. All right? I want you to grab just the loop with the red tab. Get that in your hand. One loop. Instructors, if you'll give me a thumbs up when we got everybody there. All right, John, we good? All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to sling this down. Be careful when you do it. Do not hit yourself. Don't hit the chair. Don't hit your neighbor. Sling it down and open it up. Now, don't sling it more than once. Some of y'all's opened up like mine. It didn't open all the way. That's not a big deal. 
Now, just keep in mind, though, the arm you're putting this on is probably not going to work for you. If you just got shot, you're not going to be able to use this thing. So if yours didn't open all the way, hook your dead arm and pull that thing so that it's all one loop. It's not twisted or tangled, okay? The next thing we're going to do is we're going to find that red tab. The red tab makes a little semicircle there. Imagine that's an arrow. What I want to do is make sure that arrow is pointed towards me. So before I slide it up my arm, I need that arrow pointed towards me. Turn yours this way. So make sure that's pointed right there first. Jimmy, we good in the middle? Chad and Chris, good back there in the back. Alright, y'all remember this step is important because if it's not pointed towards me, if it's pointed away from me, it's too hard for me to work it across my body. I'm still going to point this tourniquet towards myself too, even if I'm putting it on somebody else. I'll show you why in just a second, alright? Good, Chad? Alright, so now we're going to slide the tourniquet up our arm as high as we can get it. Remember, we're not going over our shoulder bone. This will not work. Your bones are in the way. So we're going to be up into our armpit and kind of parallel to the ground. You'll notice I'm pulling the tension out in front of me. This is going to make it easier. I've got this pulled out in front of me. I'm going to use my thumb or my fingers to peel that tab back just enough to get a grip on it. Chris. Once I've, all right, so once I've got a good grip on it, I'm going to punch across my body. Don't punch in front of yourself, punch across your body. Pull it as tight as you possibly can. This is not stopping blood flow, but it might be slowing it down right now, buying yourself some time. Pull that nice and tight. Now pay attention here. Don't lean the same direction I do just because I lean that way. What I need you to do is I need you to learn, lean the arm with the tourniquet towards the sky. Arm with the tourniquet goes towards the sky. All right, now you can un, uh, let go of it. Grab higher up on the tourniquet. And really crank this thing down. So Chad told you to do a ratchet. So I'm going to go this way and then that way and really crank it down. Pulling as tight as I possibly can. This first pull is super important. Pull that as tight as I can. I'm going to wrap it around. All right. I'm going to stop right here before this buckle. And I'm going to let it hang behind me. Guys, and remember the arm the tourniquet is on is a dead arm. It's got to be dangling down by your side the best you can. Now we're going to take that stick, the windlass, and we're going to turn it. You can turn it either direction. How many times did Chad tell you to turn it? <laughs> Till the bleeding stops. Now you don't have to kill yourself today in training. I promise you if you stop your bleeding, you're not going to hurt yourself. So turn it until the bleeding stops and then secure it inside the buckle there. Make sure it does not unwind. Yeah, I'm not going to crush you on it, but there you go. So in real life, you might keep going, but you don't have to kill yourself today in training. Good. Make sure that goes all the way down in there. Good. We'll get this here in just a second. We'll get that here in just a second. Hey, y'all remember, too, don't get the timestamp quite yet, okay? The timestamp's going to be our last step. Chris Pletcher, we good back there? Chris Taylor, we good? Jimmy, we good? John, we're good. All right, now, we're going to take this excess, and we're going to wrap it around again to make sure it doesn't come off. We're going to secure that kind of between our arm and our body. And then we're going to take this little white thing that says time on and pull that across the top. Wow, they're coming around to check everybody. Does anybody have any questions for me on tourniquets? All right. If you've been checked by an instructor and given a thumbs up, you go ahead and take your tourniquet off. Just take it all the way off and put it on the table in front of you. Don't worry about resetting it or anything like that. Just take it off and set it on the table.
Hey, y'all listen up too. These are, these are training tourniquets. These are not for you to take home, okay? Some of them, and, and listen, that's just a safety concern. I got plenty of tourniquets, but these things have been used for training, and I would not want you to use this in a real life setting because it might fail, okay? Tourniquets are a one-time use. When you open that thing up and you use it, you put it on somebody and it gets blood on you, this is going to go to the hospital and they're going to incinerate it later. All right? So these are not for you to take home. Just set them on the table. We'll get them. But these are not yours. All right? Now, <clears throat> what if you don't have an actual commercial tourniquet? All right? Belt is always the first answer I get. Y'all go ahead and sit down. I'm going to show you something real quick, and then we're going to move to wound packing. All right, I actually stay away from belts when it comes to improvised tourniquets. And the reason is, like, if you look at my belt and a lot of the belts y'all are wearing that I can see, they're like leather dress type belts. They're kind of rigid, right? And so what happens with a belt like that when you put it on and use it as an improvised tourniquet is somewhere in the system it's going to end up with a spiral. All right, so on the edges of that spiral you have highly concentrated pressure, which is dangerous because it causes nerve damage. And then in between those spirals, you might have like a bridge there where it's not actually putting any pressure on anything. That could be dangerous because it's not stopping or slowing the blood flow. All right, so belts actually have a very high failure rate when it comes to improvised tourniquets, so I stay away from them. I prefer some type of a cord. The buildings that y'all are in on a regular basis, could you find an HDMI cord, a phone charger, something like that? Pretty easy, right? So I'm going to show you how to do that real quick. And, it, and I'm going to show you on my leg. First thing we got to do is probably empty their pockets, all right? Because if I try and put an improvised tourniquet on or a regular tourniquet on on top of a cell phone, car keys, or other junk, will it work? No, all right? So I'm going to take this item, and I need to understand something as I do this. Improvised tourniquets have a higher risk of causing nerve damage or the need for amputation. What do they lessen the risk of, though? It's a pretty good trade, if you ask me. I'd rather you cut my legs off than me die. All right, so I'm going to start by tying an overhand knot, just like when I tie my shoes and I'm going to pull that tight. Do y'all think that I could get this tight enough by pulling on it to actually stop my blood flow? Even if you grab it and you grab it, could you pull that tight enough to stop it? Not going to happen, right? So I need to, to create a mechanical advantage here. I need a windlass. I don't happen to have one, but I see one right here. Can I make a windlass out of this pen? All right. Any other straight object, I'm going to take it. I'm going to lay it right on top of that first knot, tie another overhand knot to hold it in place, and now all I have to do is twist. This is super easy. Could y'all do this right now if you had to without even thinking about it? So we're not waiting anymore for somebody to bring us a tourniquet. We're putting one on and stopping or slowing that bleeding as soon as we can, right? Keep in mind, though, this thing will come undone when I let go of it, so I've got to hold it. And also, as soon as I possibly can, I... Oh, thanks, Chad. I do want one of these because they're much more effective and they do not cause nerve damage or the need for amputation. Make sense? Awesome. Questions on tourniquets? So a lot of science and research went into creating commercial tourniquets to have circumferential pressure, which means the pressure is even 360 degrees around that injury. And so also the thickness has something to do with it. So how wide that is, it spreads that pressure out. And the science behind it keeps it from causing the nerve damage. You can't regulate that with the way that uh, I improvised there. So there was the way that it works, there ends up being like when I spin it that way, it tangles up my pants and it pulls the skin on my leg up into there and it hurts. So you end up pulling all of that up into that knot. And so there's a, a big pressure point right there. And then also opposite that on the back of my leg, there's another one there just because of the way the, the mechanics work of it. Anything else before I move on? All right, we're going to jump into wound packing. Somebody tell me real quick the areas that we pack wounds. All right, so... Real quick, and I know, again, y'all can't see this super good from up here, but you're going to break out in a second and go to one of the stations where the trainers are. Now, I'm putting on gloves. Do you think in real life that I would put gloves on in an emergency? This is probably one of the reasons why, is because it's not always easy to put rubber gloves on. Number two, somebody said it, you don't have them. Timing, all right? So most people in an emergency don't put gloves on, don't freak out. If you touch blood, go wash your hands with warm water and soap and tell the first responders when they get there that you have touched somebody's blood. All right, they'll take care of whatever testing protocol applies to that state for you um, when they get there. All right, now, so the areas of the body again, shoulders, front and back, pelvic girdle, and butt. Christine, turn this, oh, there you go. All right, so what I would do, 
we're going to imagine that this is one of those areas, right? I'm going to take my gauze. This is rolled gauze. There's lots of different types of gauze. But I'm going to unroll it because that's the quickest way for me to now get this gauze into this wound cavity. I'm going to ball it up. I'm going to make a clump. Y'all pay attention here. The clump is the first thing that goes into this wound. Most people want to come up here and dig around in there and explore. We're not doing that because there could be something sharp down in there. There could be a broken bone, bullet shrapnel, something that would cut you, all right? I'm not worried about trading blood with this person. I'm worried that if you cram your hand in there and cut yourself and it hurts, you pull your finger back out. Now they're bleeding and you have a little cut on your finger, all right? The clump goes first and you're going to take that clump and you're just simply going to push it down into the wound. You're going to push as far as you can in there, right? Now, as I push into that wound, I'm going to hold this pressure and I'm searching real quick. Can I feel the source of their bleeding? If I feel the source of their bleeding, I'm going to continue to hold pressure on it. If not, very quickly, I'm going to start grabbing gauze with my other hand and cramming it in there. Front, back, sides, anywhere I can get gauze. Now notice, this hand stayed. It has to stay in there and hold pressure. If it needs to come out because i got a pack on that side, that's fine. But this hand has to go in first, and then this one comes out to pack on the other side. Now, once I have it completely filled up, I'm going to hold direct pressure on it. You'll notice I've locked my arms out and I'm trying to lift myself up off of this table. That's how much pressure I need to put on there. I'm going to hold that pressure until somebody else comes to help me that's more highly trained than me, until it's dangerous for me to stay with this person or until I'm physically exhausted. All right. Keep in mind it could be multiple rolls of gauze, it could be gauze and improvised packing material. Does anybody have any questions on wound packing? All right, listen. There are six wound packing stations set up, two wound trainers at each station. There's gloves all around. There's gloves up here. There's gloves on each side. There's gloves in the back. If you all want to get to your reception on time, we need you to cooperate with us on this. Jump up, grab some gloves, head to one of the stations there. All right? Bring your gauze with you from your table. Bring your gauze from your table with you. Bring your gauze. <coughs> You want that one? 